I come to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So, if we generalize, there are two occasions when I am with someone in our cemetery or memorial garden. The first occasion is, perhaps not surprisingly, during a funeral. And the emotions expressed at those moments are very different from any other time. And these emotions are affected by each person's faith. For some, this marks the end. The internment marks the finality of life. But we know differently. St. Paul, in his letter to the church in Thessalonica, expresses that we need to be different from those who grieve with no hope. Our faith in Christ brings us to that belief that death is not the end, it's the beginning of a new life. Jesus wept. That is perhaps the most powerful verse in all of Scripture. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, chides Jesus that if he was here, if he had come sooner when they had first called for help, her brother would not have died. And those are very real emotions of someone who has not yet seen the reality of life beyond death. It's these emotions that often flood our cemetery and memorial garden. Yet as strong as the flood is, it will not change the tide. Even now, the grass in the cemetery is turning brown and leaves cover the ground. The plants in the garden will soon be cut back for the winter. And just as sure as the sun rose this morning and tomorrow, spring will bring with it new growth and colorful flowers. It's not as much a resurrection as it is life everlasting. Brother James Coaster of the Society of St. John the Evangelist reminds us that in making the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, we say something specific about the dead. We boldly, brashly, and with incredible audacity claim that the dead are raised to life. This does not deny the reality of death. Such audacity claims that death is not a disaster, nor a wall, nor the end. It claims that death is a door, a gate, and a new beginning. The second occasion that I'm with people in our cemetery and memorial garden is when they're looking for a particular grave or marker. And it's during these times that I hear the stories of their loved ones. They share with me the good, the bad, and the ugly pieces that form the fabric of their lives. They may weep at these moments, but they're cathartic tears. There are tears of sadness, but also tears of joy and love. These explorations of finding a grave are the family forming connections beyond death. So there's a very interesting view that we each face three deaths. There's the moment that our heart stops beating. And this is the time the doctor looks at the watch and they call out time of death to be noted on a medical chart. This is the moment that brings with it so many emotions, raw and unfiltered, sullen and consuming. Jesus wept. And so do we. The second death 
is when our brain ceases function. This moment is silent and invisible to all but the most sensitive medical instruments. And then the third death is when our name is last said by someone on earth. This death comes when we slip from the memory of the living. Now how this view interplays with our view of everlasting life is a topic for another day. But this, is, this third death is recognized and celebrated in some cultures. This past summer, our Vacation Bible School included a series of Disney films, including the movie Coco. And Coco is set amidst the Mexican observance of Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. This is the time when families gather to remember the friends and family who have died, to tell stories, and to say their names. In doing this, we recognize their effect on our lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly all make us who we are. It all guides us to lead better lives today. So we tell the stories. So our favorite show in our household is the British production, The Repair Shop. And in this show, damaged items that hold many family memories are brought to a repair shop that is part of a living museum. And here, experts in their field conserve and restore the items. Unlike the other British production, the Antique Roadshow, which has found its way here as well, where unique items are presented for identification and valuation, in the repair shop, the value of the item always relates to the family memories that are held within that item. The tattered teddy bear, the war-damaged clock, become links to beloved family members and their stories. We can never replicate the lives of our beloved family members, but we can see them as an inspiration. We can never live into the same ministry as one of the saints, but their lives can encourage our own ministries. These stories and memories are important influencers for us. Now, this is not to be confused with the current social media influencers who will show you new decorating trends and diet trends, complete with suggestions of what and where to buy something, affiliate links provided, Rather, the stories and memories of family members and the saints are there to influence our lives into living a life aligned with Christ. So as a young student, I was a soccer player, at least barely. And because soccer was not a common sport in the U.S. during my youth, we had very few examples of what a good soccer match looked like, what a good player did or didn't do. We couldn't watch soccer on YouTube or TV. We barely knew who won the World Cup. But then our coach took us to Philadelphia to watch Pele. My world of soccer changed. Seeing this magician on the field, I finally knew what soccer was to look like. With no judgment of whether Pele should be named a saint or not, <laughs> this is what we see in the saints of the church. When we reflect on their lives, we see how to play the game. In reflecting on the life of St. Francis, 
we will never do the things that he has done. But like Francis, we can rebuild the church in our own way, in our own time. In reflecting on the life of William Wilberforce, we will never stand against the slave trade as he did because we live in a different time. But we can take a stand for others. Jesus wept. And then he called for the stone to be removed from the cave where his friend Lazarus had been laid. He said to him, come out, unbind him, free him to live, free him into action. The remembrance of the saints who have gone before us unbinds us into action. We have been knit together with the great cloud of witnesses, with all the saints. Today we will be tied together with ribbons of different colors, different memories, different actions. These ribbons are to us a door, a gate, a new beginning. The concluding paragraphs of this sermon will not be with words but with action. The action of remembering others so that they do not experience that third death. The action of remembering others so that their lives are reflected in our lives. The fabric of our lives has been woven by the saints who came before us. And with these ribbons, we will continue to weave the fabric. And when the last ribbon is tied, we will all say, Amen.